So I'd like to welcome uh, Paolo from uh, Henkel Tech Ventures. Hi, Paolo. Good to see you again, my friend. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> nice to be here. So, uh, welcome. Today's topic is going to be around how can investors lead new investments during a pandemic. Uh, we're also going to be giving some perspectives of corporate venturing, the context for corporate venturing, which I'll, I'll give an overview of. And then the main uh, main course for this uh, this discussion, and we do want to make it quite interactive in discussing, is, is Paolo covering the Henkel and his perspectives and uh, your perspectives around how do we lead new investments sort of during a pandemic. During the session, I would suggest, please, you keep yourselves on mute um, because it just stops the, the pictures jumping around. And uh, please put some comments or questions or points of discussion and that within the chat. Uh, and then we can pick those up when we get to the end of, uh, of, of our respective sort of presentations. Uh, if you're looking at this on a laptop, you can use your mobile phone, open the, the camera on the phone. And during my presentation, I'll be showing a few uh, items which you can then link through the content, you know, because you can't click on the screen when, you, when we're doing these sort of things. But you can use your other device for doing that. So hope that's clear to, to everybody. So brief introduction uh, and context and that for myself and that really. We're seeing now so much convergent technology, so many new business models. As we're going to hear from Henkel around new materials, uh, biotech, sustainable green areas, uh, digital, which when these combine together are creating sort of new business models. And we're seeing that across very different industries. So, for example, within the energy space, moving from central large energy uh, production through to distributed energy, new devices. Uh, and now with uh, electric vehicles, solar panels, uh, wind turbines, some very different distributed things that are happening within the, the mobility and energy space. We're seeing in the health space, moving from just looking after sick people in hospitals to new devices, new active pharmaceuticals, and data now playing such an important part in health uh, and wellness. And even during the pandemic, we're seeing the countries that have got control of this pandemic it's probably more down to data and testing than it is necessarily around the treatment and that, that of, of keeping our population sort of safe. And then artificial intelligence, big data, changing to automated systems for transactions uh, are, are driving uh, things within the consulting space, within the advisors, within the white collar space and that as well. And then, of course, we've got uh, retail, the high street, home deliveries, uh, and the future of retail and the whole blended experience sort of changing in that as well. So we're seeing across very different industries, different applications of devices, technologies, and data. And what I want to give a quick overview in terms of the, the work that we've been doing in AIM of R and we published in a book three years ago which will hopefully provide some context to Henkel around what we see as what are the key five principles, five Ps for doing strategic innovation and venturing. And I think during uh, Paolo's talk, we, we'll be covering this as a very sort of new example and that within this sort of space. So first of all, what's the purpose of why a corporate needs to innovate and why it needs to do venturing? Well, the changes in technologies and the change in business models we've just highlighted means that it becomes imperative for organizations. But whether you're trying to scout new technologies, whether you're trying to build new business units, um, whether you're trying to make a financial return in building those ventures, those are the purposes we're talking about. And then the processes include things like open innovation, uh, incubators, corporate venturing, corporate venture capital, taking minority stake investments in startups, and investing in funds. And you, uh, Henkel are going to be talking about their direct direct investments and also investments in funds like China Material here in, in different places. Now, central to the five Ps are people. So that's the third P, 
And that's about the people who've got the skills within a venture team, uh, around the engagement with around strategy with the, the key executives within the organization, within business units, and the relationship with partners such as funds, such as startups, such as other corporates within the ecosystem. And then the fifth P, which comes around the cycle, is what's the performance measures you're looking to achieve? So you're looking to make a financial return on your investments? Are you looking for strategic insights? Are you looking for building new business units and that within your organization? So that, this becomes a sort of a full circle. And, and I was looking up that uh, it was back probably about five years ago now, Paolo, that we, we, we ran this yep. review, overview and that with you at that, that, that Henkel. So yes, uh, exactly. we've been do, doing this now going, going back for a number of years. So for corporates who are setting up their corporate venturing, this is a model that we've used to, to, to help them think about that. But probably about four or five, three or four years ago in aim of our we started feeling that it wasn't just about doing one-off investments but what's happening within the value chain so what's happening with new devices what's happening with the data that's coming off the, those sort of devices what's happening with the new business model of how you pay for things and what's happening with the new relationship with the consumer so an example we've talked about a number of times on various these webinars that, that we've done, electric vehicles, for example. So the transformation from uh, an internal combustion engine where you just buy a vehicle and it's pretty dumb to now an electric vehicle, which is going to become autonomous, which you're going to be doing vehicle sharing. And the relationship now with the consumer and with the, the person using that could be on a daily basis, could be, you know, you know, on a constant basis because it's an autonomous sort of vehicle as opposed to the one-off sale and the, of, of a device. So very much different business models and we'll, we can talk about different examples. So we very much believe it's about bringing together technologies, bringing together startups and bringing together corporates. And we'll get some examples from, from Henkel, I think really in the, moment, in the moment. And also what corporates can do is do this globally. So this is not just about investing near to where your head office is or near to where your funds are but it's about how do you bring these things together across the global platform so so how do you bring this stuff together when well, you've got this view of the strategy you've got this view of where business models are going to change within your sector so one of the things that we believe is that when you're creating your venturing, you need to be looking at, you know, through the insights when you're out there scanning different funds, when you're out there working with different corporates, you're scanning, you're seeing different technologies, connecting them and seeing what's relevant and that's strategically for your organization. Now, you're then into doing the detailed review, due diligence, and then making an investment. And, and you know, that can go from in a year looking at a thousand opportunities down to making half a dozen, 10 investments. But really it's about what's happening throughout that funnel and the insights that come through that is really important. Now, we, we've done over 150 interviews, podcasts, uh, videos and that over the last, um, over the last 10 years actually, I started these, um, these podcasts. And um, you can go and see those on um, Apple, Google Podcasts, and all that. If you scan through here, you will you will see those. So just before I hand over to to, to Barlow, um, just wanted to highlight that we've done a series of these, which are available on our video and podcast channel. And coming up um, in September, we've got the head of Shell Ventures. Um, speaking, and we've got the head of resources at Innovate UK looking at technology and investments the UK government is certainly making, but I'm sure there'll be similar things in other countries where they're looking now on the innovation and support as we come out of the pandemic. So as there was just sort of 10 minutes there. I wanted to give some context to, to this corporate venturing to the context we're going to be speaking about how corporates do venturing. And so we published this uh, in our book about three years ago now, which sort of covers these the, the, the overall points, really. This corporate venturing, to the context we're going to be speaking about how corporates do venturing. And so we published this uh, 
in our book about three years ago now, which sort of covers these the, the, the overall points, really. Well, my name is uh, Paolo Bavai, and I'm a PhD chemist. Uh, I worked uh, 15 years, uh, as I always say, for the real chemical industry. So I actually joined uh, Hoechst AG in uh, 1996, and uh, then uh, the part where I worked became uh, Celanese Chemicals. Um, so I did work uh, 15 years in Celanese Chemicals. Ten years ago, I joined uh, Henkel, Adhesive Technologies. I'm not so sure how familiar everybody is uh, with Henkel. So Henkel is a 20 billion euro company. Half of the company is the adhesive technologies business, which is, if you will, the uh, industrial B2B business of Henkel, the material science business. And the other 50% is then our laundry and home care and our beauty care business, which is uh, our fast moving consumer goods business. Uh, and uh, I uh, uh, joined the um, industrial um, area, so Henkel Adhesive Technologies um, built uh, a new business development function there, and this emerged then into a corporate venture capital. Um, and um, yeah, and uh, what we are doing there, I would like to share with you along with the presentation. So Henkel Tech Ventures is really the corporate venture capital arm of Henkel Adhesive Technologies, as opposed actually to Henkel X Ventures, which is the corporate venture capital arm of our fast moving consumer goods and digital area. Next slide, please. So um, we act, our the idea is um, we would like to team up and reach out to talented minds so why um, should we do that and this is basically describing a little bit um one of the piece andrew mentioned the purpose so the um research capability of uh henkel uh, as of any other large company is focusing more and more really on the core business so within the core business we can do anything we want and we can develop any product and technology we would like to develop but if we would like to do something which is adjacent, something which is outside of the core business, we are losing more and more the capabilities and skills to do meaningful technical innovation there. At the same time, um, we are also uh, getting uh, more and more uh, impatient. Um, so when you develop a technology in the material science area, it takes really eight years from uh, starting developing the technology until commercialization, on average, eight years. And uh, Henkel, and, and as I said, I think this is uh, nothing uh, special for Henkel. This is true for any other large company. Um, so we are not anymore willing to really wait these entire eight years without really knowing what comes out. What is up, you know, at, at the end of these uh, eight years? Is that a prosperous business? or will we fail to develop a certain technology? So the idea is to um, reach then outside of Henkel out to, um, uh, to technologies which are built outside of Henkel and sh which we probably could not have um, developed ourselves. So that, that, is, that is the idea why we do corporate capital. So we are, if you will, the window um, towards um, those uh, externally developed technologies there are also um, other activities in Henkel Adhesive Technologies, how to do that. Uh, for example, strategic IP management and also supplier innovation. And as um, these are also certainly sources uh, for innovation coming from outside Henkel. Next slide, please. So what, do we, what are we looking for? Um, so um, we are basically looking um, for um, along all kinds of uh, growth phases. Uh, we are looking for a long-term commitment because um, in the end, we would like to run a meaningful strategic joint project um, with uh, the op our operating business and the startup. And uh, these developments might not then take any more eight years, but they will take a little bit longer than half a year or a year. And um, it's important to understand that we are, we do have that long-term commitment um, in, in mind. Um, we are basic, we basically don't care where the technology is uh, around the globe. Um, we can, I mean, we, we take it wherever it is. And um, it has to be, of course, somehow related to our operating business. Um, as our idea is to, on the one hand side, strengthen the operating business, but on the other hand side, also 
to enhance the operating business. So it should have some relationship um, to our operating business. Next slide, please. So that's the team. It's, it's really a, a global team um, uh, with uh, um, whom I'm running um, that process. Um, we have people um, in the United States close to the Boston area, as uh, we believe that the Boston area is really one of the hotspots uh, for material science innovation due to the MIT and Harvard. And uh, we do have a colleague uh, in Israel um, due to the Hebrew University and the Technion University, which uh, is also quite important in terms of material science development over there. And uh, we do have a colleague uh, sitting in China as we put more and more emphasis also on China. And the rest of the team sits in Dusseldorf where our global headquarters is. Next slide, please. Um, so um, we, uh, we, of course, we need to um, have some focus and, and guidance uh, to where we are looking for um, uh, those startups and innovations. So we did develop three clusters, if you will, uh, search field clusters, scalable technology platforms, new business mod models, and our internal Henkel incubators. And the next slides will actually give you some um, insights, uh, what we mean here in particular. So scalable technology platforms, here we are talking about new engineered and formulated materials. So we are more looking for formulated materials than for uh, chemicals, for chemistries. Uh, we are looking for um, after smart uh, surface ideas and smart surfaces for us is actually on the one hand side functional coatings, but on the other hand side also making a surface smart with sensors, for example, and then driving a um, digital business uh, from that. And I think in the discussion with Andrew later, we will come back to the smart surfaces as um, here we see a lot of uh, traction and a lot of deal flow right now uh, related um, to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Circular economy is uh, also very important um, for, for us, uh, as well as advanced packaging, which is somehow related to circular economy and sustainability per se is a very important um, driver uh, for Henkel. New business models is uh, predictive maintenance, which, which is the um, digitalization of our maintenance, repair and overhaul business, if you will. We have a very solid and profitable business there. And we would like to digitalize that more. Circular economy here comes again. Here it is about the new business model about circular economy. Then we are talking about data driven business models. So how can we monetize the data we are accessing through our operating business every day? And we talk about uh, design engineering centers. Um, our internal uh, Henkel incubators, uh, 3D printing and print, print electronics um, is, are certainly also supported by our activity. So we are looking for companies strengthening what our colleagues are trying to do here. Um, so uh, we, we built a, a network, uh, of course, and um, and Andrew mentioned uh, it's, it's really a people business and you all know that. So um, I think we, we do have a um, very good team uh, in place um, to do that and uh, very um, uh, differentiated and versatile and uh, a team. Um, we, you know, when we look at a startup company, Henkel expects us to have an opinion about uh, will the startup make it or not. And uh, since we don't have a crystal ball, um, we certainly don't know the future of that particular startup. But we have to um, come to an opinion here. So, and um, how we do that is to look at these startups from very different angles. And these different angles are provided by different people with different backgrounds. So we have in the team um, different um, professional backgrounds, different working experiences, different cultural backgrounds, and so on. And all these different aspects will give us a better picture or better opinion um, if a startup will probably make it or not. And then we also established an external network, which we are also um, consulting uh, to participate in our, um, in our um, uh, opinion building uh, process. Uh, we do scout uh, 3,000 uh, startups a year. They come mainly from the four fund investments we did. So we started actually um, in, with an investment into um, Emerald Technology Ventures and Pangea Ventures to cover North America and Europe. 
We then reached more and more um, out to China, investing into CM Venture Capital, which was um, formerly China Materialia. And uh, I mentioned already the emphasis on sustainability, uh, which led to the investment into circularity capital. So the idea, the idea really is to find outstanding collaboration partners because the collaboration with the startup is really where we drive the value. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Um, and um, we, we somehow, sometimes these collaborations also lead into investments. Here are um, uh, six investments uh, in our portfolio um, in very different in very different areas. So uh, Vitriflex, um, Dropwise, and Binano Crea is really material science, uh, more on the uh, coating area. Coprint is uh, in our investment in Israel, which is um, our copper nano uh, inks um, for conductive uh, for conductive inks for print electronics. And Zaperatec is a recycling technology. And Zaperatec actually is an interesting example for um, how we would also like to uh, tackle um, new business models along with material development. So Zaperatec is recycling of flexible packaging. Flexible packaging is a plastic and aluminum layer which is glued together with an adhesive. We are the market leader for that adhesive. But our customers have more and more also legal requirements to, um, to, um, uh, to recycle their industrial waste. And they don't have a good technology today for doing that. So Zaperatec developed that technology. And with their help, we can, help our, we can offer our customers now also a recycling um, technology. So we basically virtually close the circle for them um, supplying the adhesive, but also helping them with their recycling problem. Um, for us, it's a new business model. And uh, for them, it's a, it's a new adhesive, which is tailored for that recycling um, process. So I think uh, together with uh, the startups and with co-investors and partners, we can really change our industry. Next slide, please. So what is um, what is in for the startups? Uh, because um, I talked about uh, what Henkel would like to achieve with that. But th these collaborations, as you know, only work if it is really a win-win situation. So what is in for the startups? So this, the startups, we are offering a long-term collaboration, which is very important for them. We are also, because also, because also they are faced and confronted um, with the point that developments take a lot of time. We do offer them access to our very large customer base. So in the adhesive technologies area, we are serving 130,000 customers directly and a couple of million through distribution. So this is really a treasure for any startup company. And we are serving almost any vertical, any producing industry. So um, if a startup has to focus on one or two market verticals, we can take that technology and commercialize that into other verticals. So this is how we both win in, in, in doing that. Um, we, of course, we, we um, help them with, with our uh, technology expertise, with our market and uh, technology know-how with mentoring and uh, from time to time also with uh, investing into them. So we can invest into the first in the, into a first investment up to 5 million euros. Thank you very much. So that was a little bit the introduction of what we are doing. And now I'm uh, very much looking forward um, to the discussion with, with Andrew and everybody here. Great, Paolo. Thanks very much for that. Great, great insight overview, and thanks so much for sort of connecting it really to to what I covered there around you know the purpose, the, the importance of the people, the the geographical spread, and that you've got. And, and with that sort of venture example you gave as well about this combination of special materials, sustainability, new business models, and the digital aspects and that as well, which is which is changing for for yours and and other industries so, so that's that's great so um, can i ask a couple of questions first and i've seen some uh, comments to that in the chat so we'll cut we'll come to we'll, we'll come to those sort of in just a moment so on the topic of today with the pandemic how are you seeing the flow of deals 
and and managing the deal process now we're all doing it from our bedrooms and spare rooms and <laughs> occasionally coming into the office as i saw you yesterday in your your dusseldorf office so 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 how, how are you dealing with deals at the moment during the pandemic yeah so um surprisingly uh we do see a quite intense and large deal flow so in the first place uh, we thought uh, i mean we, we we thought about two effects one effect we thought about was that the deal flow will simply shrink significantly that didn't happen the other effect which we thought about was that um a lot of um you know kind of um immature um bad startups um, will will seek uh, investments uh, because they are running out of money and then they're desperate uh, to get um, to get money uh, from somebody and uh, approaching um, whoever is around them and there's also something which we didn't see so uh, what we what we see is uh, a quite intense and increased uh, deal flow and we see an increasing quality of uh, of uh, of deal flow and that was to us at least surprising in terms of uh, content um besides the the normal topics uh, we see in our deal flow of course uh, covid 19 has uh, um you know um a clear footprint there so um we we see um a lot of antimicrobial antiviral technologies uh, coming along i have to say um at least our experience 90 percent of that is really not good uh, it's uh, you know um, from from not so good until really you know charlatans you have the entire band with and but 10 percent are really good and uh, t because i think 90 percent are trying to capitalize the current pandemic so they have to be very quick and in order to be very quick, you know, I mentioned that it takes eight years to develop a technology. If you would like to do something and resolve something now, you don't have these eight years. So they are trying to do computer simulations and so on on, on these coatings, which um, doesn't really work for us. We really would like to see a real effect in an experiment. And then we have 10% um, of super interesting startups in the antimicrobial, antiviral space who um, actually share what also is my belief that um you know um we should use the momentum right now to work on this topic even if we might be too late to resolve the COVID 19 uh, problem problem because of course we all hope that we will um, develop a meaningful immunization soon and uh, therefore um, uh, you know, um, don't need, might not need the antiviral technology right now for the for this current pandemic. But I think the next uh, viral threat and the next viral attack will come. We just don't know when and where. Yeah. Uh, but I think I'm absolutely sure that this will be even more severe than what we currently see with COVID-19. So I think we should use the momentum right now to be prepared for the next um, viral um, attack. Of yeah. That. Yeah, definitely. I've just I've just completed a podcast with um, Savio Kwan, who was chief operations officer at uh, Alibaba. And in that podcast, we talked about what happened in SARS in 2002, 2003, yeah. uh, you know, and what we've seen with Ebola and other things. So, so this is going to be a recurring thing that we need to be preparing for now and use this crisis. I agree to sort of prepare ourselves on that for uh for, for the for the next areas so you're you're, you're seeing a, you know a surprisingly better flow of deals um and better pitches and that as well after after sort of sorting ones out um the, the geographical spread you touched on china materialia called cm ventures we we had min on one of our sessions uh, a couple of months ago so people can go and watch watch that that video but i'll be interested in your perspective in the the china innovation sort of space in terms of the the tech and the business models and that there what's your take on on scouting with a with a partner like uh, cm venture so china is of course a fascinating area for us um, because uh, there are a lot of good universities uh, doing material science and consequently also good very good startups the issue for us is and this is why we did add china later in our process the issue is simply a, a cultural hurdle i mean when we um, go um, to a startup in europe or in the us um, and we if you talk to them 
we can then, you know, from their body language conclude, is it real what they are trying to tell us? Is it not real? I mean, are they bullshitting us uh, or are they really great and, and geniuses? If you go to China, to be honest, um, uh, a lot gets lost in, in translation uh, if they don't speak Chinese, but if they don't speak English, but even if they speak English, I mean, it's uh, it's it's a different kind of, uh, you know, uh, physical expression, <laughs> I, I would say, and very, very difficult for us uh, to sense. So I, I do have a colleague um, in the team who is um, Chinese and, and located in Shanghai and who, who is helping us. But still, it's very difficult from us. So we are dependent here a little bit on the expertise of China Materialia, how real um, the development and the startup is and how good they are set up in order to survive in a Chinese uh, environment. Because that's, that comes on top that also the economy and the startup uh, infrastructure in China is very different from Europe and the United States in and in Israel, of course, and um, so we have to we have to make sure that that they will make it, and um, and this is something where we really need the advice uh, from from China Materialia. Yeah. Definitely, I think on the uh, um, another topic uh, why China is so interesting for us is uh, the fact that uh, most of the startups, um, when we looked at that two years ago, it was seventy five percent are not seeking an exit through uh, being acquired from a strategic company, but they are seeking exit through an IPO. So they are holding on longer to their business and are really trying to develop more revenue and really significant revenue until they do the IPO. So you see more startups there with significant revenue, which is actually good for us. So, I mean, you know, we're a conservative company and uh, we, if you, if you, if you would like, if you invest into a startup, uh, it really helps if we would uh, see some uh, revenue. And um, in, in China, that is uh, not so difficult, actually. Yeah, yeah, no, good, good points. Because I, I think certainly what I've seen over the 15 years I've been going to sort of China, they've gone through the phase of just doing the stuff like we do in the West um, through to improving processes. And as you say, getting to that revenue point faster than we sort of see in the West. But also, I think we're now seeing, as you said at the beginning, the quality of the technology and the quality of the developments that they're doing in these new materials, in artificial intelligence, in the data sort of side, and that now is is, is certainly accelerating. And when I was running programs in Tsinghua last year, you, you would certainly see those sort of science areas in Tsinghua compared to the MITs and the Imperials and sort of stuff like that as well. But also that you raised some really good points there around, you know, the, around the culture and the people aspects and building the partners there who understand that ecosystem and then also how you connect this stuff globally in that as well. So I think that, I think that brings, brings that together sort of really well. So, so thanks so much for, for, for that. That's probably enough questions that from me. So Paolo, just build, building on that a bit, so what I see with you know, people in Corp of the Crow's Nest you know, on the boat looking out into the future while the oil tanker of the corporate sort of continues along and, and you start seeing the future before the rest of the organization so are there any themes in that at the moment like you just touched on here the um you just touched on that investment you talked about that that you know you've now invested but back two or three years ago you wouldn't have necessarily invested in it so are there some technologies or business models that you're seeing now that you still haven't persuaded the core business that it is strategic? Because sometimes it's strategic because it's what the business unit wants, but I often say, well, that's tactical, isn't it? You know, you want to <laughs> you, you want, you do your, but you, you are, you're almost doing the business unit in adhesives out of a job. If you got away with, a, if you got rid of adhesives because you did 3D printing and you didn't need to stick things together, then the adhesives would be out of a job. So what, what sorts of themes are you seeing at the moment on the top of the crow's nest that, that the business hasn't necessarily seen yet that you're trying to... That's actually, that, that's a very interesting point, Andrew, that we see stuff the uh, broad organization is not seeing. And since seeing is believing, we are telling them what we see and what we are excited about. And we have sometimes issues in excite make them exciting excited and um, uh, since they cannot see that they do, sometimes don't believe in in certain areas so um, uh, really in the uh, in the um, area of uh, digitalization um, this is uh, uh, um, 
quite an important um, roadblock uh, from time to time. Um, you know, we have a we have a um, printed electronics business, which is basically selling conductive inks. Um, and then we have um, all these um, customers, I mean, all the 130,000 customers I was talking about, all major brands in the world. So what we really would need is um, the application in between. So we are looking there for application builder. And uh, very often we see super interesting applications, uh, which we could, where we could use our conductive inks and where we could provide value to our to the brands who are anyways tag, um, customers of us and uh, sometimes uh, these uh, these topics uh, really you know didn't excite uh, our operating business and uh, and then we, we we cannot do that because um, we um, I think that entire process of um, getting the buy-in of the operating business is um, important for us as they are providing in the end the resources to run the projects with the startups. So if they are not excited and convinced about a startup technology, they would not provide the resources for the collaboration. And then again, we would end up uh, being a, a financial investor. So um, yeah, so that is, um, I mean, you know, in, in, in innovation, um, it's not always a matter of good or bad. It's also very often a matter of the timing. And uh, if the timing is not right, um, we can see the best things in the world. And um, yeah, and we, 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 we actually we have a little Excel spreadsheet where we lock the things which we are seeing and then we follow up from time to time. And uh, then we see, oh, that's, that would have been a great opportunity. <laughs> so why didn't we catch it? Uh, but also, I have to admit, also sometimes um, we see stuff which we thought would be a great opportunity and which turned out to be a flop. So, I mean, yep. we're we seeing, we are seeing both sides and, uh, um, but I, I do believe if we, um, we, we will, we will stretch them and we will push them our, our top management for and continue to do so, because if we don't really try to push the envelope hard, we are not innovating hard enough. If we are only doing, the two obvious topic topics, then the development and the innovation will be relatively incremental. And I think it's really the stuff which is not that obvious, which might be a game changer in the future. And uh, it's our job to articulate and communicate that in a way, the operating business is convinced about that. And uh, yeah. we have examples where we are, um, you know, putting up certain targets two or three times, um, and you know, um, running against the wall, no problem. We stand up and run again and try a little different direction and see if there's the wall too or if there is a door. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, that connects me to uh, Min, who runs China Material. I, I, I first met Min when she was in uh, in a consumer goods technology venture unit in California. And yeah. uh, one of her colleagues told me about how they pitched four times a startup that they had seen. And then their corporate ended up acquiring it for over a billion dollars. And it was just an online consumer sales business. And they had the <laughs> four times and they walked away from it because, oh, it's not strategically fit, not the business model that we're in. And and it cost them a billion dollars when they did it when they did acquire it and that that, that, that later so that so they were there seeing those sort of technologies and those the, the, those areas and that um, before the core business and seeing how technology business models are changing. But, but we but we have to be fair, I guess. I mean, you know, um, the the times are changing and uh, people also also we get educated along the way. And we should also allow our top management to get educated themselves along their way. It's a little bit a time lag between us and them, um, but um, they are improving and they are getting better. And, and, and this is why uh, I believe, um, and, and we are actually, the consequence for us is um, that uh, if we, um, if, if, if something was uh, was uh, rejected by the operating business, but we believe it's really worthwhile doing, if you're putting that on that Excel list, that we can take it up half a year or a year, a year later, because um, 
their belief might have changed and they might have seen stuff which uh, you know changed their mind and uh, so it's i think it's it's uh, it's not uh, you know coming again it's not for the purpose of uh, coming again and again and again it's yeah. because yeah. because things are changing and also yeah. um uh, the educational process of our top management yeah. um, you know progressed yeah thank paulo very much for uh, his insights um giving us the experience of the many years now of uh, venturing and that within uh, within these special materials and and how those are now changing with digitization and, uh, and all of those uh, and what we're now dealing with within the pandemic. So thank you very much, Paolo. And I look forward to seeing you and keeping in touch again. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much.